Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome, welcome today to the Miss Texas Show. We're so happy to have you, and we are so happy to have our lovely guest that is here with us. Uh, we hope everybody is doing well today, and we want to make sure that we start off by letting you know a little bit about the Miss Texas Show and a little bit about um, our guest who is here with us today. The Miss Texas Show is where we showcase life in Texas and beyond and highlight amazing survivors of traumatic events family violence, sex trafficking, sexual abuse, and community leaders who share community resources. Under our segment, Military Time, we invite military and veterans who would like to share with us their experiences during and after their military service. We run this segment in partnership with the National Veterans Chamber of Commerce. We would like to invite those who have overcome traumatic events and would like to share and are now ready to help others as well. Under our Beauty for Ashes segment, we invite fellow pageant sisters, winners and nominees, artists, whether that's musicians, actors, models, dancers, as well as any survivors who are now ambassadors for the cause to share with our audience their lives and the impact that they have made. Our show runs twice a month. And if you would like to become a guest on our show, you can email us at MsUSATexas at gmail.com. So that's M-S-U-S-A-T-E-X-A-S at gmail.com. Or you can message us on our Facebook, which is also at M-S-U-S-A-T-E-X-A-S. So with that, we have a lovely guest today, Denise Bazart. Um, I want to tell everyone a little bit about Denise. Denise is actually... And uh, not only is, is a poet, but also an award-winning writer, photographer, and artist, which I'm very excited to delve into. She is also a certified meditation facilitator and contemplative arts teacher. She is an information technology professional working for the Houston Independent School District. She holds a bachelor's in chemistry, a uh, master's in computer science, and a PhD in developmental neuroscience, not a small feat whatsoever, and she is a survivor of childhood sexual abuse. She spent her adulthood healing herself from the traumatic impact that that abuse had on her life. She is not a mental health professional. She is a thriver who has traveled a healing journey and is able to share a personal guided experience for readers to find and engage in their own journey to healing to becoming thrivers themselves. Her unpublished manuscript, Thriving After Sexual Abuse, was a quarter finalist in the 2019 Book Life Prize Nonfiction Contest self-help category. Whether writing on overcoming trauma in her nonfiction work or recasting her life experiences into award-winning dark urban fantasy in four novels, so we have Glamorous, Beginnings, Return, and Readings, Denise tackles the dark side of things with courage, fearlessness, and compassion. Her self-published book, Glamorous, was a bronze medalist in the 2019 Wishing Shelf Book Awards in Adult Fiction. And her success with Glamorous earned her membership into the Horror Writers Association and the International Thriller Writers. She is also a member of the Nonfiction Authors Association and the Texas Association of Authors. She lives in Texas with her husband, with her husband Randy and literary cat. <laughs> is it uh, Sophia? The yeah. Sephira. Okay, nice. Oh, that's so lovely. Love the literary cat. So with that, it is nothing but a pleasure to have you here with us today. And I want, would love to give you the opportunity first to just let our viewers know who are you, you know, what led you to all this work, just a little bit about yourself to start us off. Sure. So I think you covered all the kind of professional aspects in the, in the intro. Thank you so much for sharing that with everyone. So I am a survivor of incest, and my perpetrator was my grandfather, my mother's father. And I'm not exactly sure when it started. I know I was very young in elementary school when it started, and it lasted until the point that he died when I was a freshman in high school. So it was absolutely devastating experience to have that happen to me, all aspects, emotional, physical, mental, even spiritual. I mean, it just touched every part of my life. And I went from a really outgoing, interested in people, creative kind of kid to totally turning inwards and being a complete introvert and really just afraid of people, as you can imagine. Um, I was taught by what my grandfather did to me that the world's not a safe place. And people that love you, who are supposed to take care of you and nurture you and empower you can do the exact opposite. They can take your power away, your voice away. and in my DNA, I learned that the world was just not a safe place and that any time something bad could happen to you. And so I, when I was in elementary school to, to deal with that, 
my brain just basically said, mm -mm, you're not going to have memories of this. That's the only way you can deal with this. It's too overwhelming. It came out in nightmares. And I had a recurring nightmare that a monster was trying to get me to consume me. And so that was a little release valve, I think, that my brain was allowing me. But for the most part, it just locked down. And when the abuse happened, I can look back and I can see that I was dissociating from my body. It was the safest way that I could deal with the experience. And so that went on for quite a while. And when he died, when I was a freshman in high school, all of a sudden, all that effort that my brain had gone to <laughs> to keep me safe, it was like, okay, he's not here anymore. So we're going to start letting you remember. And then it came out in memories and flashbacks in body memories. And it was as you can imagine, overwhelming. I thought I was going crazy, you know? Um, and I just didn't know what to do, how to handle that. And so I poured myself into school. I had always enjoyed school, got good grades. And I really was a person that worked really hard at school because that's where I got a lot of positive feedback from teachers and, you know, teacher's pet <laughs> kind of thing. But I just poured myself into school. I was in marching band, the drum major, I was in girls basketball and I was in all the honors classes and I just poured my energy into that. So I wouldn't have to think about it. I wouldn't have time to remember. And so I wasn't really healing. As you can imagine, I wasn't really doing much healing at that point in time. I was just surviving, just surviving. And then I got into college and I met a friend of mine and he was um, a recovering alcoholic who was going to Alcoholics Anonymous, and he really encouraged me to try to get some help. So I went to the counseling center, and it took a couple of tries to find the right counselor, but I found someone I could really work with. She got me into a women's group of other survivors, and then my friend helped me get connected with survivors of incest anonymous. And that really was the start in college of my healing. And I think it was a really good combination to begin with, getting a therapist, um, this person wasn't necessarily trained in trauma um, at that time, way back when it wasn't something that was a specialty. So certainly we have the opportunity for people to access experts in trauma and abuse now. But at least I had someone who was there for me, a neutral person that I could talk to, that I wasn't afraid of sharing and being rejected, being shamed. I could just tell my story to her and we could work together. And then the women's group was amazing. There are people who had all kinds of sexual assault uh, experiences that they had gone through and they were different ages and they were on different parts of their journey to healing. And it was amazing to finally meet other people who had gone through what I had gone through. I had a older cousin who was abused and she and I had kind of revealed to each other what had happened and she was a bit of a mentor to me. But when it's someone in your own family, you kind of think, well, my family's just messed up. <laughs> you know, it's just a, a few of us that are that are having to deal with this. And, and even though it feels a little better that you have someone to talk to, there's still a sense of isolation because you don't realize that a lot of people, you know, one in four women, one in six men have had some kind of experience like this. But I didn't know that until I got into this women's group. And then the survivors of incest and ominous was another wonderful thing for me because it included men and women. So for the first time, I realized that it could happen to men. Here was this wonderful young man. He was very good looking in my opinion, and he was a model. And yet he had suffered this through, through um, his father's workplace. And there was a man who was basically the age of my grandfather when I was being abused, probably in his seventies. And he broke down crying, sharing his experience of his mother abusing him. And it was shocking because I had just thought, those kind of men were the predators, <laughs> you know, and here was someone who was suffering and, and trying to heal, trying to work through it. So all of those experiences really was a good foundation for my healing. That, and I worked through that through college. And then I realized that I needed something more. I just wasn't going deep enough. I wasn't feeling healed enough from doing that kind of therapy. It was critical to do that kind of therapy with groups and with the therapist, but I, I just needed something more. I was still disconnected from my body. I had learned to hate my body. It betrayed me. I didn't want to be in this body. And in fact, I didn't want the attention when I was going through school. Here I was torn between wanting to 
to connect with boys and to date and to have those normal teenage experiences. At the same time, I was terrified, absolutely terrified of that. So I would dress really baggy clothes, really kind of unappealing. I had my hair cut short. I, I actually, looking back, I was trying to make myself as unappealing or, or at least an androgynous enough that no one would look at me. And at the same time, my heart was crying out for love because I wanted to be loved. So it was this fight with myself this whole time and this fight with my body. And going through therapy with the therapist and the groups didn't touch on that for me. And I wanted that to change. So I started uh, to look into doing some yoga. Originally, it's kind of funny. Originally, I decided to look into yoga because my husband and I wanted to start a family. And I'm a type A person, research, find out all the information you need to know. And I was found out, well, yoga is good when you are pregnant. Okay, so let me back up and let me start doing yoga before we get pregnant. We, we eventually found out that it just wasn't going to happen for us to have a family. But I went ahead and pursued the yoga. And it was life-changing for me. It cracked me open. And I started to really get in touch with my body, have a lot of um, body mini memories that were released. And it was incredibly healing. Now, it wasn't an immediate thing. I didn't jump from I started yoga and, oh, it's so healing. It was a little scary at first because I was afraid of some of the poses. They, I felt so exposed. And it was just not sure I could do the poses, but I didn't want to draw attention to myself in class. I was afraid of the teacher saying something or, you know, it was a male teacher that I started with. I wasn't wanting him to adjust me because that was part of the, the normal, um, healthy yoga experiences. They help you get into the poses. So I sat down and had a conversation with him. And of course, he knew someone who was abused. His sister was abused. He totally understood. And he uh, and I worked out that he would let me just do other poses that I felt safe in or not do a pose. He wouldn't call it out. He would let me decide if I needed to be adjusted. And I, and I learned to trust. I learned to trust him and I learned to trust my body and how I felt. And eventually I could work through and I could do all the different poses and feel safe. But it was a transition from hating my body to learning to love my body. And then I started learning other things like meditation, I got into photography and expressive art. So I started pulling together all these things that really worked for me, that really tapped into different aspects of my personality that I felt needed to be healed. I, as I mentioned, I was that real creative kid. I was writing poetry when I was in elementary school and drawing pictures and all these things. And that voice um, was kind of stolen away from me, that energy, that, that creativity, curiosity, expression. And so finding ways to get back into that kind of activity was really healing to connect back to that inner child, to heal that inner child, and to learn to just be expressive again and be fearless in my creativity, which translates into giving some of that fearless energy to other parts of my life. So slowly over the time, from the, the counseling, the yoga, the meditation, the expressive arts, being out in nature, I slowly gathered things together that, that worked for me and that I continue on now because I enjoy them so much and they are so beneficial to me. So I, when I was doing yoga my, and I was, I say cracked open, I was writing all kinds of poetry about my abuse and about the transition, my healing journey. And my husband really encouraged me, you should share this. This is really important information. You could help other people. I'm like, who's going to want to publish a poetry book, <laughs> especially about this stuff? And I said, oh, yeah, I just, I just don't think we can do it. And part of the problem, too, is I am one of those people with, I looking back, probably was PTSD. I, I mentioned I just didn't allow myself to remember. And so I have huge blocks of time that I just don't remember stuff. And I can't access memories around that. So I don't have a memoir that I could write to explain what happened when and what was going on in my life. So I'm like, again, what do I do? How, you know, how do I share this? Well, when I, the news broke about Dr. Larry Nessar and his abuse of the Olympic gymnast, my heart just broke. It just broke. And I thought, someone should help these women. Someone needs to help these women and women like this. And I thought, you know, I may not be, have a memoir in me, but I know all these things that I did to help myself. I could write a book that would tell people 
these are the things that work for me. Let's do this together. Let's uh, have you get a journal and I'm gonna write to you about my experience. I'll ask questions in the book about each of the things that I'm suggesting you try and you can journal about it. And I'll explain how to find a therapist if you're at that point in your journey. If you've already got a therapist, I tell you how to find groups and how to do all these other things that I've done. And it's not a prescriptive 30 day um, work and you're healed. <laughs> it's not a seven step program. It's okay, let's explore this. What is it that you find enjoyable? Do you like physical exercise? Do you like being out in nature? Let's walk through all of these opportunities, see what resonates with you and build your own plan for healing. I'm giving you a guide, a blueprint of things you might try, but in the end, we're all unique. We all have our own abuse history. We all have our own potential healing path. I certainly want folks to do the work with the therapist because as you try these other things, you're gonna need someone to bounce those off of and help you process. But beyond that, I really am just offering different ways to explore healing for uh, the readers to understand how they might move from surviving into thriving. Absolutely, and I appreciate so very much about what you said and resonated with so much of it. Um, I know that I'm still new for the viewers who might not know me yet, but I am. I didn't introduce myself at the beginning, but I am the co-host and my um, the violence that I survived was domestic violence. But mm -hmm. I also um, have advocated for victims of sexual violence and all kinds. So of course, any type of violence, I'm always you know very passionate about this topic and definitely appreciate you and all the work that you've done as well. And so much of it definitely resonated because like you said, healing is not linear. So unfortunately it's not, it doesn't follow this one path like you mentioned. And so unfortunately, as much as we would like it to, because see, we are in a society where in America, that's, you know, that's what we're told. It's like, you should just go out, get a solution and then that's it. So when it, that does not occur, it messes with our psyche. Like, well, then why isn't this happening? Like, why is this not happening overnight? I did all the right steps and all of that. But I also really appreciate that you said how you mentioned about the memory part, because that's major. I think that, you know, we talk about trauma, and what it can do to us, but our brain, which really is a protective factor, that's part of the protection. It's incredibly frustrating, you know, if you want to, you know, be able to write down a timeline of things that have happened to you, but it is normal. It is normal. And so I just think that I appreciate that you mentioned that because when something like this happens to you, nobody like plans for these things. These are not things that we ask exactly. I don't think I would have said that I would have wanted my life to go down that path and have that experience. But when it does happen, your mind does try to protect you in that way. And so, you know, you might not remember, and it might be for your benefit, to be honest. There are some, in my case too, there's some blocks of time that I can't go back to. And I always wonder, I'm like, why can't I, why? Like, is there something wrong with me? But it's not. It's not, and your mind is definitely helping it. So that's why I think it's wonderful too that with that being said, that you do so many things that have to do with the mind, like with meditation and with all of that. I also love how yoga really was one of the freeing things. You know what I mean? You tried the therapy and that was interesting. And, you know, shout out to all therapists. We definitely think that that is valuable, but like you said, it wasn't the only thing you needed. And the other thing is that honestly, even for those who go to therapy, it's not for life, right? I mean, you're not supposed to go to therapy forever. That's actually not the goal. And so- <laughs> to find these other things what I'm curious about too is that like especially with photography and with all of that did you always know that those were going to be your outlets did you try different things first you know was there that like did you always have these talents inherently do you blend them all together do you give certain time to each one a little bit more about that if you don't mind sharing yeah, absolutely. So I just was stumbling along blindly. <laughs> I, I didn't have a guide. I didn't have a blueprint, which is, you know, one of the reasons I wrote the book is like, what would I have liked to have had way back when I started my journey that could help me? I didn't know what questions to ask. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know what to try. And, you know, we have so many options now because of the internet. And I, you know, I referenced a lot of different websites that you can go to and a lot of different places to try things but I, I just didn't know what to do. And so I was always creative. I, I love to write, you know, those little short stories or those little poems. And, and when I was a kid, none of that was about the abuse. Remember, I blocked that off. So I was just writing fun stuff. You know, Thanksgiving dinner, we're at my grandparents in Illinois on the farm and I'm writing the mighty hunters have set out, you know, the silly little poems, but I was being creative and expressive and I really enjoyed that. And that was something I kind of kept with me. It was an outlet that I managed to just hang on to tenaciously as I was going through all the abuse and even entering into college. It was something that I kept doing because it was somehow it was keeping something alive in me. 
I wasn't consciously planning it, but something inside me would never give up on myself, would never let him win. And I don't know what it is. It was grace or something, but I just kept going because it was something I had to do. And then my father gave, actually gave me a camera when I was in graduate school. He gave me one of his old cameras back when there was still film that people use. And I just fell in love with it because it, it, it really made me focus. It brought me into focusing on what I was looking at through the camera. I wasn't my mind racing to remember the past and suffering from that. I wasn't anxious about the future. I was just there. I was there with the camera. I was exploring. And somehow it made me feel safe enough to go out because there was like a barrier there in some way. This camera was a protection for me and I could just go out and, and feel comfortable to go take pictures of things. And so it was never consciously planned that I would try this, but something would bring it into my life. I know something carried in through my childhood with the writing, getting the gift of the camera. And I just decided I wanted to explore. It made me feel good. And so I wanted to keep exploring and just trying different things, trying a potter, pottery class, trying this watercolor class, just something to explore, never expecting that I was going to be a professional artist, but wanting to explore and try things and finding that it was so nurturing. So even again, I wasn't consciously planning every step of the way, but what I was granting myself was some self-care, some self-compassion to try new things and explore. And then after I had gotten far enough along in my healing journey, I could look back and I could say, oh, these things are helping me in this way. Let me keep nurturing those. Let me keep finding ways to explore those and make those continue to be a part of my, my practice, my ongoing practice. You know, a normal human being that never suffers from assault or abuse, you learn, you explore, you're constantly growing if you allow yourself to be a continuous learner. And that's just a natural process of what we are as human beings. So for me, the healing was uh, using these practices would just kind of get over that large mountain of suffering and resistance and everything that had happened to me. But once I got over that and healed through that, then I could just enter into the world of the curious, exploring, ever learning human being and continue that today. Now, I don't want to give the impression that there's a point in time where you never think about or remember or are triggered. Okay, I don't want to give that impression to people because the healing, as you mentioned, it's not a linear process. It's two steps forward, one step back. And people should understand that and have compassion for themselves that anytime you take a step back, you haven't lost what you've done. And actually, it's kind of a spiral. Every time you have a new experience, you have more resources, more resilience, more experience that you can bring to whatever is coming up. And then it will have less impact over time as you go through your healing. So I, I just started being more um, focused in, I, I, I don't want to use that word analytical, but introspective, I guess is a better word about what I had done and what was working for me. I read a lot of self-help books. And so I pieced it together and it was just at a certain point in time, I could look back and say, oh, all of these things are gifts that I explored and brought into my life that have meaning for me, that help me heal and can keep me enjoying my life, having a rich life, and make it a, a joyful life if I continue to do the practices. Absolutely. And I think another thing that was interesting about what you mentioned is that I, I like you, was also a star student. So I think I find mm -hmm. that so interesting too, how you also had mentioned earlier about that. And what it also made me think of was something you reminded me too with what you were saying now is that you were doing so well there. You love the positive feedback that you were getting, but essentially it was kind of like you were distracted. You know, you weren't necessarily healing. You're more so just, like you said, focused in a different area. So although on paper, you looked very successful and you were doing such great things, people might not have any idea, you know, that all these other things were happening under the surface. Absolutely. These... Absolutely. Nobody knew. And I ended up going to kind of the other extreme. When you, we talk about pouring yourself into school, I pushed it to the point of perfectionism. I was trying to be so in control of my life to counter how out of control I really felt inside that I went to the point of perfectionism. I expected myself to be perfect. And if I wasn't, nobody else knew, you know, I didn't get a hundred, I'm beating myself up. I got a 98, everyone's impressed. So they didn't see what was going on inside that I was just the self-criticism of 
you know, that if I didn't make the 100% every time I was, you know, pushing myself to a physical limit, mental limit, because I just felt I, I had to be perfect. And part of that was, if I was perfect, maybe this would stop happening. Maybe it would make me good enough because the message my grandfather gave me, you're worthless. You're unlovable. You're, you're worth nothing. I can do whatever I want to you. No one's going to help you. No one's going to care. No one will care because you're a bad kid. You're a bad person. That's why this happens to you is because of you. It's all your fault. Now, he didn't tell me that. Some people have the actual verbal message of that, but I intuited that. It was obvious from what he said and um, or didn't say and what he did. I knew it was wrong. I knew it didn't feel good. I was terrified of him. I never wanted to be alone with him if I could possibly avoid it. Unfortunately, I couldn't. We would have you know, holiday dinners with the family and I would do everything I could to never be alone with him in the same room. Not that I could imagine he might do something in front of the family, but that's how terrified it was. He was the monster of my nightmares, right? And so I had to figure out a way to find control in my life and I push it to perfectionism. But then you're always going to be beating yourself up because how can you ever be perfect? No one's perfect. And so I set myself up to not only have someone tell me I was worthless and, and would never be loved, that I was telling myself that. And I had internalized his voice and set myself up for that. So a big part of my healing was learning to let go of that. Now, I still have that I'm a type A person, got to do the best job I can and attitude. But part of what I was learning to do was to stop the negative self-talk. I learned that for some books. I learned that from friends who would support me because I would even put myself down out loud and they would tell me, no, you know, you need to, did you hear yourself? Please don't do that. You know, they were very supportive. And then just um, meditation was a good place. Yoga helped the body, the body memories, the body integration, but meditation helped me realize I wasn't my thoughts, that I could be in a space here in present and not have the, my grandfather's voice tell me all these negative things, not have my perfectionist voice pointing to the future that I had to do better. I could just let all that go and be. And it was scary not to have those voices condemning me, judging me, but freeing. And slowly being in that space and working with my mind, I learned that I didn't have to do that. I could connect with my authentic self and listen to the voice that was kind and generous and loving and creative and be that person for myself. Absolutely. And then what it, and so I agree. I definitely think because the mind is just a whole thing. And to live there, we definitely don't want to like just be, you know, a prisoner to our own thoughts, but it is easy to. I mean, we can never say that, you know, we don't, we don't, you know, think very heavily about what it is that we're not heavy critics. And again, our society does that too. You know what I mean? No matter what we think about, they definitely add that added pressure. And so I know that if we're speaking to anyone who's thinking about that and resonating with that, we hear you. You know, we feel very similarly is that that can be a lot. And I think. You definitely shed a lot of light on that that negative self that negative self talk, but like you said, also the negative messages you were hearing from the abuser. And I think that that's major because we want people to know like that's actually what is a tool that is used by abusers to help them be successful. I mean, they do have a goal. You know, if you know, fortunately, as negative and as horrific as the goal is, it is a goal that they have. And it benefits them for you to feel that way, to not love yourself, to not see yourself as valuable, because the minute you do, you're not going to want them in your life. And so unfortunately, that doesn't benefit them. They, would, they want to continue to have access to you. They want to be able to do that. So for you to then take the time to undo that, as difficult as that may be, you definitely deserve that. So if there's anybody out there who's on the first step of that, as you as you're hearing, we definitely want you to know you have full permission. And so, but it's it's that part of the journey of giving yourself that permission, right? To be able to take that mm -hmm. power control back because you absolutely were robbed of it at that time. But being able to know that you absolutely deserve to be able to take that part back and you know do what you can. And but it was uh, you know, a normal human being doesn't necessarily you know go through traumas and maybe it, you know your life looks different um but two like what i also want to make sure I said is that i think that when these things occur to individuals you're still normal you know you're still a normal human being it's just that what happened to you is not normal you know what i mean it's not violence is not supposed to be a natural part of people's lives it's not it's not meant to happen to you you definitely don't deserve for it to happen to you but you know you are still you at the end of the day and because this 
traumatic thing does occur to you, it is absolutely okay for you to then find whatever you can to regain that happiness, something that was definitely threatened and, you know, might have been harmed in that process. So whatever that looks like for you, and I love how you mentioned, you know, what you did, you know what I mean, to be able to find that out. But I think it was a perfect segue because I did want to ask you more about meditation. And you mentioned it was that, you know, yoga definitely help with the body. And I agree. That's such a big part, you know, when something happens to you and you remember, there's some places that could be triggering too to many individuals. I know people mentioned that they can't visit certain places after things that occurred, you know, things like that. But that definitely can be a big one, but definitely that mind part. And so what I'm curious about is, um, is how was your journey with meditation? Like, how did that start off? Was it easy for you at the beginning? Did it take time? I'm sure it might not have been, you know, just normal, you know, off the rip, unless you, you know, just were born a natural <laughs> meditation <laughs> expert. Um, but what did that look like for you? Sure. And I want to let everyone know that we've gotten to the point where we are blessed to have trauma uh, informed yoga practices. You can research those online. So this is a, a set of yoga practices that are specific for people who are have suffered through trauma. And like I was saying, there's certain poses or certain things that are challenging. So um, although you can definitely get benefit working with a regular person with yoga, the yoga um, for trauma survivors is, is wonderful too. And we also have mentioned before I jump into you answer your question that we have uh, trauma-informed meditation as well, because sitting down and being quiet and just being there with your mind after all those things that you do to protect yourself, to keep yourself from thinking about it, to set up the barriers, when you're asking yourself to sit down and be quiet, it can be overwhelming. And so keep in mind that that's just a normal pro part of the process. Anybody who sits down to meditate, all of a sudden they think, my mind is crazy. All these things are coming up is because they're not distracting. You don't have your cell phone. You're not, you know, driving, whatever it is. And so that's a normal process, but it can be a little overwhelming for people who have suffered trauma. So just be aware of that, you know, talk to the person who's helping you with the meditation instruction, inform them about the, um, pra the practices of trauma-informed meditation. I include some resources in the book, but for me, I was fortunate in a way. Yoga came first and I spent a lot of time in yoga. It was several years that I was doing yoga and I was going two or three times a week because I just needed to really get into it and do the healing and it made me feel good physically. And so I had several years of yoga before I jumped into meditation. So by the time I got to meditation, I had processed a lot of what had happened to me in my abuse. So for me, the meditation didn't have that extra layer of intensity, but I did struggle like any beginner. I was like, I can't get my mind to shut up. <laughs> you know, we're dancing here and there and traveling around. And, you know, I'm supposed to sit here and follow my breath and let the, the thoughts flow through like they're clouds in the sky. And I go right along with them wherever they're going. Here I am hooked and I'm off and away with them. So it was challenging for sure. And just the physicalness of it, you know, sitting for, for a period of time, it can be hard and achy. And you know, so all of that was there. But I just really was convinced that meditation was going to be beneficial to me. And I was in a real um, enriched place. I started doing it at the Shambhala Center in Atlanta, Georgia, and a beautiful center, beautiful people there, and such gentle, compassionate, kind people who, even though they didn't know about my abuse, that was just how they were in general with people and training them to meditate. And so I worked my way through it. And again, I, I had done so much work before, I didn't have a lot of abuse things come up. But I did have to learn to, to work with my mind, turn my mind into an ally instead of it being the, the thing that would beat me up all the time. And just finding ways, you know, I was so perfectionistic and wanting to, to prove my worth, essentially, that I had a lot of stress in my life, you know, a huge amount of stress. And the meditation helped me reduce that as well, that I could lower the expectations and give myself time where I could just be instead of doing you know, just be and finding that it was okay to just be and it was okay to just be me. So that was a real gift. So it, it was something that had its challenges to learn through and no one's ever a perfect meditator. You, you know, you can talk to Pema Chodron and the Dalai Lama or anybody, you know, these famous people and they talk about their struggles because our, our minds are our minds and we just, every day, I feel a little different because you're in a different place, but you just, you show up and you give yourself the gift, five minutes, 10 minutes, whatever it is that works for you. And you just let yourself be and breathe. And 
it's amazing what happens. It's amazing what happens. Absolutely. And if we didn't already mention that healing itself is not linear, definitely, as you can see, like as you're going through the journey, neither is that. So it's just, it's okay. Some days it goes a lot more successful and then some days it doesn't. And so that's why I'm just so glad about what you just shared is that. So if there's anybody out there who's thinking that this sounds really good, maybe not for me because I'm not necessarily someone that can try that and all that. As you heard, it doesn't just go the same way every time. You know what I mean? You might be dealing with more one week, other weeks it's easier. Like it's just, you feel so much lighter and all that, but you can give yourself that permission to, you know, to just try it and do whatever you can. And also give yourself grace because I mean, you are, you're dealing with something completely new after having dealt with someone, something that you did not expect to have happened to you. And so however you deal with that is completely up to you. And as you mentioned, you're finding things that, you know, make you happy. And so maybe that is for you, it might be things like Denise mentioned that are also very, you know, personal or creative and things like that. But maybe for other people, they find happiness in other ways. And maybe it is more of scientific because I also find it intriguing though, that you also have the background in like neuroscience and all that, you know, you have that kind of background and have this creative side. So obviously we're multifaceted people, you know, so like <laughs> there are to us, you can be very unique and have all these different things, but whatever that outlet is for you, give yourself that chance to find out oh, whatever that is. And even if you're thinking, well, I have no idea, that's completely fine too. It's a great place to start because then mm -hmm. that means that the world is your oyster. You know what I mean? Then that means you have this multitude of options. But I really appreciate what you said about just being. So I think that in our world today, it's just rush, rush, rush. And just, mm -hmm. you know, the pandemic actually was interesting because <laughs> I think he, yeah, I, I actually slowed down. I did not realize how fast I was moving throughout my life and just how I did not breathe. Um, mm -hmm. And I have, you know, I do have like daughters as well. So yeah, they do take up <laughs> time also, <laughs> but like, you know, even just on my own, I just didn't realize how like packed my schedule was, you know, things like that. So I just really appreciate what you said about that and just taking that time. And that's why I also just love the practice of meditation itself. And so it's something that I've delved into. I'm not like, I'm also in the beginning steps of my journey, baby steps. But mm -hmm. I agree that that's what's great about it. You know, it gives you that chance of reflection. And so I feel like, like you said, I love the word introspection um, for those who might, you know, haven't used it. It's definitely that inner work. Um, mm -hmm. And that's what a lot, you know what I mean? It's really getting to know, you know, who you are and rediscovering yourself too, because that's okay mm -hmm. to do it. Well. If you have to peel off these layers of who you were, that we want you to do that because you do not, you never need to be defined by what happened. And you mentioned that Denise, for sure, is mm -hmm. that, it definitely was not something you ever wanted. Unfortunately, it took up, you know, a big part of your life. And honestly, even if it hadn't, it was, the impact was going to be there regardless. Mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately, it did take, you know, take on some time, but you were able to shed those layers, you know what I mean? And rediscover this new person and, you know, be able to do that. And so what I now would love for you to say too, is that speaking of that, you know, what does it look like in the world now? Like what all, you know, what do you usually do? What kind of like services do you currently provide? What is a day in the life of Denise? <laughs> Especially with oh, your literary cat. <laughs> sure. You know, obviously a lot of it is doing my IT job, which I, I really enjoy uh, being, there's creativity in that. And it's both sides of the brain. You're being creative, being analytical, solving problems, making sure you're supporting uh, the district and the schools and, and helping students in every way you can with the data that we have about their performance and their improvement. So I, I find a lot of joy and and get a lot of value out of contributing in that way. So that obviously is, you know, a good eight, 10 hours of my day spent doing that. But I do a, a yoga practice every morning, a little bit of meditation. And that's when, you know, the, the cat comes in, and she'll do yoga with me because she loves that vibe. She loves that energy to be there. And she'll lay down while I do my yoga work. And it's a way to set my day. You know, it's a way to get things settled and to set my day. And I will drive to work and usually I'm listening to some kind of podcast because again, I'm a lifetime learner and it doesn't have to be about trauma. It's about, you know, just all kinds of stuff that I listen to Brene Brown and Dr. Tama and um, I listen to Clear and Vivid with Alan Alda. I listen to things that interest me because again, I'm interested from a scientific mind perspective in a person who's healing and a person who, who's creative. So I love to listen to podcasts on the way into work because it's just makes the drive go faster, but I learn a lot and it's inspiring. I get inspired when I go into work. And then after work, I, you know, try to, to get some exercise. I make time to spend time with my husband and, and the kitty. And I don't watch much TV. In fact, we don't use, we have a television, but we just use it for Netflix and Amazon Prime. You know, we don't even watch regular TV because I'm usually working on art projects. I'm teaching art. And a lot of times on weekends, that's what I'm doing too. 
I need to get out in nature a lot. That's one of the things that I ask people to explore. And it's a great place where you, and if you're not a person that says, man, you're talking about sitting down and being quiet, that's not going to work for me. Try walking outside. You know, there's a practice of meditative walking where you just try to be present and see what's around you and enjoy it. And, and I do that when I go to nature. There's all kinds of parks and arboretums here in Houston. It's amazing. And for me, that's incredibly nurturing to be out in nature. And if I have been a while since I've been outside in a space where I can move and walk and do some photography and feel the breeze and the sun and just hear the birds and just absorb all that. If I don't have that on a regular basis, I know it, I can feel it. I can feel it in how I feel and, and what's going on in my body. So, you know, I try to make time on the weekends to at least go walk at the park if I don't have my camera that I grab to go explore with the camera and just keep engaged in the things that bring me joy because that's really that's what it's all about we, we deserved that joy we deserve to peel back those layers and find our authentic selves and find out what we want to share with other people what we can do to bring um, joy into our lives and the people that we care about and just live our lives fully be thrivers right that's the word that i like to use for my book thriving after sexual abuse is be a thriver, whatever that means to you. Find out what that is, what jazzes you up, gives you energy, gets you out of bed, keeps you going. Whatever it is that means something to you and brings you home to yourself, find it and just keep doing it. Absolutely. I definitely, and that's funny because that's what the other word I was going to get back to was the thriver. Because I found that very interesting that you said that, that mm -hmm. I'm not, you know, I might not necessarily be a therapist, but I am a thriver and I work to help other people be thrivers. And so um, definitely want you to, you know, delve into that in a second. But I also wanted to definitely highlight because there were so many great gems that you just dropped right mm -hmm. there. But I agree that it's that, you know what I mean? It's just giving yourself that chance to find it. And I'm in Ohio. I know that by now, um, by this show, you might have heard that by now, but um, I don't have as much, you know, the beautiful scenery is in Texas so like it, it definitely looks different but I also love just getting outside I agree with you I love giving my you know my fitness watch something to talk about like giving my steps in and all that but it's just something so freeing about doing that you know I'm just reconnecting and just you know allowing the universe to just speak to us you know what I mean and just mm -hmm. having those messages and opening that opportunity up but also knowing that when it comes to hearing negative voices and positive ones, negative ones are gonna always be louder. They just naturally are, unfortunately, especially because they're just so much more critiquing. They speak to our insecurities. So it's really easier for us to stay there and stay in that place, but you don't need to. So we're at least letting you know that that's not the place that you need to stay in. You could be a visitor in those places. <laughs> want you to live you know what I mean it's so like please give yourself that exit strategy and not you know feel that you have to stay there but in order to do that you have to have some kind of environment where there's positive voices you can let them in you know and so whatever that may look like for you and I find it super intriguing that like you mentioned that you're able to you know use your time that way so you are you know you do have this one job where it's this kind of focus and all that but then you have this incredible new creative world that you enter when you get home you know what I mean you can share that with your husband as well and so I just think it's wonderful that you can do that and I think that too is that I think sometimes we think we might not have enough time with everything that we have going on I mean I also have a nine to five so it's like I have all that work that I have to dedicate there you know what I mean and do all that but that's what we're saying is that it doesn't it doesn't have to be like a certain schedule it doesn't have to be a certain prescribed amount of time it could just be you know a few minutes that you take after whatever you've had done um it could be a lot more maybe it could be more on the weekends if you have that opportunity you know whenever it is and whatever it is mm -hmm. just give yourself that chance to be able to do that for sure but thriving I agree so that's interesting and I love the word so how did you arrive there like so did you like come across that word did somebody give it to you but how did you have that because I love that philosophy and would love for you mm -hmm. to share more about that for sure sure and you know I like I said I read, read a lot of self-help books and they you know talked about victims of sexual abuse and we all start off there we are all starting from a, a point of being victims of sexual abuse sexual assault that's just what happened to us and that is the truth for us but then we start moving into the place of surviving where we're trying to move beyond that. We may be struggling. We may have behaviors that we developed to, uh, to combat what we were experiencing to deal with at the time. And all of a sudden those behaviors are not working for us anymore. They're you know, kind of interfering with the life we wanna have, but there's something there that we're, we're, we're exploring. We're trying to find something to improve and we're moving beyond just being a victim. We're trying to take ownership of our lives and it may be an immense struggle, but things are shifting, things are changing. 
that we're still impacted. We're still caught up with what happened to us. And on the cover of my book, I, I was very purposeful in the imagery that I used. I have a ball and chain and the chain's broken open. And through that broken chain grows a rose. You know, and a rose to me symbolizes love, but it's not the external romantic love. It's love for myself, love for yourself. And then you've got this beauty in this beautiful red rose because we all are so beautiful and we should learn that we are beautiful and embrace that beauty. And then of course the rose has thorns that gives us an ability to protect ourselves and have appropriate healthy boundaries. So all of that to me was important to share um, on the cover to express what the book was trying to do. And I, you know, he asked me, well, where did I come up with Thrive, Thriver? And I don't know what it was. I don't remember reading it explicitly or someone saying it, but I just read about trying to thrive, trying to be, you know, in this place. And I thought, Survivor, Thriver. I want, you know, it's kind of has the same sound with the ER, but I wanted to be this person thriving. And I, and so I just thought thriver sounded like a good way to describe that in one word to, to kind of release that whole word of survivor, which I've heard over and over and people talk about, it. I'm like, that's not good enough for me. I don't want to just survive. I want to thrive. I want to be a thriver. So I, I kind of came up with it, I guess. Um, so if, if someone out there has been using it before, I apologize, but I took ownership of it, I guess, when I decided to, to write my book. And I really wanted it to be right there on the title, you know, thriving and being a thriver, because that's really to me what it's all about is to move into that place. Absolutely. And I think, too, like I would I would hope, you know, not, that that's not the only word that's copyrighted in our English language. We tend to use a lot. You know, we all <laughs> share. But it's definitely something that I agree. I, I love um, love hearing it. And they definitely think it's something we should all ascribe, you know, because I agree that instead of just living, you know, what I mean, always just going through the motions and just day in, day out. Why can't we thrive? You know what I mean? Why can't we just give ourselves that chance? Just like, and like you said, I love, definitely love the imagery of the rose for sure with the thorns, that beautiful imagery that you just give us and that, you know, wonderful depiction, but you know, with other plants too, like what do they need in order to thrive? Like any type of plant, you have to water it. You know, they actually benefit from being spoken to with words of love. You know, I've heard that uh, before too, but they need all these different elements. So do we as human beings. I think it is so easy for us to just pour into other people. You know what I mean? Do all these other things, even if it's just, again, I'm not just speaking to any other parents and things like that and just and wives, you know what I mean? Like yourself and all that. Uh, but like you, like you mentioned, employees, you know what I mean? Sometimes we pour a lot at work. Sometimes we get home, we're so exhausted. We cannot pour back into ourselves, but we're telling you the importance of you need to though. You know what I mean? And even if it's not that day, it's okay if it's not that day, you came home, it's too much, but finding some time outside of that, because we don't ever want you to just be living a life where it's exit, you know, it's exempt of happiness. It has no happiness in it. You never feel like you're able to breathe. You never feel like, you know, you're free at all. That's not the life we want for you. And that is, you know, and that may have been your life before, but that definitely does not have to be your life now. So I think that we should all to be thrivers. I think that that's like a beautiful way of saying it. And I love that it is on, you know, your book and that, you know, you speak to that and you live that, you know what I mean? You live that yourself, but you give these great tools and, you know, tips to be able to help others do that. Um, and with that, I definitely wanted to be able to say, speaking of the books, is that how can people, you know, find you? Because I mean, you've definitely said a lot of great things and just, mm -hmm. and the books themselves and all of that. Could you definitely let us know how we can find all that? Absolutely. So the main website I have for the book is thrivingaftersexualabusebook.com. And you can find all about the book. It has a link to my blog. I'm on Facebook at Thriving After Sexual Abuse. I'm on Twitter, Am Thriving After. And you can find me on all that social media on LinkedIn. So you, and my uh, website for the book will take you where you need to go for that, all of that. But be sure to just check it out. I, you know, when I'm on my Facebook site or I'm on my Twitter site, I do share some things about specifically about trauma and resilience and overcoming, but I share my art. I share my photography. I share my poetry. I'm, I'm trying to inspire people in every post. I'm like, may this be a benefit to someone that it may not be something specifically re related to overcoming and to thriving, but I want to share and show that I'm I'm walking my talk, you know, I'm doing my work and I'm doing what works for me and sharing that with people and hoping to give some beauty and, and inspiration to people that way. So definitely on social media, thriving after sexual abuse book.com. And you can find my book, Thriving After Sexual Abuse, Break Your Bondage to the Past and Live a Life You Love. 
that's going to be out on Amazon and Barnes and Noble and Apple, just everywhere you can get your books. It's going to be widely distributed. So you can just look for Denise Bossert, B-O-S-S-A-R-T-E. And you can just search for me on whatever platform you normally pick up your books and you should be able to find that book for you. Lovely, lovely. So as you heard, I mean, if there's any place that have books there, you can find it. <laughs> you know, like, there is an opportunity. We made it accessible um, to you. But definitely, I would definitely encourage any and everyone, um, as you can, to definitely do that. And, you know, just learn more about these wonderful things that we've mentioned and just, you know, get more of that, you know, delve deeper into that. And if you felt like you didn't have any other place to start, this might be it. You know what I mean? Just picking this up and adding it to your list, because as Denise mentioned, as a writer herself, she also indulges in other books, you know what I mean? So like it takes, you know, continuing to, you know, constantly be that ever growing learner and knowing that we always learn, you know, right? Because as human beings, we can always evolve, right? There's always opportunity for that growth and it is okay to do it at any stage in our lives. There isn't a point where we reach where we just plateau and that's it. We have learned everything that we can learn. <laughs> There's always an opportunity. So we would definitely encourage you to, you know, do that and take part in that and definitely make this part of it if you can. Denise, is there anything else you want to share with our viewers before we wrap on up? I just want to give you the opportunity. You've already said wonderful things, but I just want to give you that chance. Sure. I just want to encourage people to give yourself the gift of trying to either start a healing journey if you haven't started one or to explore other possible things that you can do on your healing journey to expand what you're learning about yourself and how you're growing. And it's a gift you can give yourself and you're worth it and you deserve it. So please make that gift to yourself. Absolutely. And I just, I cannot, all I want to do is just emphasize that, you know what I mean? Add exclamation points to that. Mm -hmm. And definitely that that is absolutely, that's really the reasons why we like to have these, you know, conversations, right? It's just because we know that you might not have heard those messages before, and we don't mind repeating these messages until we're blue in the face to let you know <laughs> how much you do deserve it, you know what I mean? And to undo any other harm that you ever heard in the past, and just know that absolutely everything Denise said, and then some, that you definitely do deserve that, and that's why, and that's why we love dedicating our time to these things, and so, you know, here we are, you know, having this conversation on something that we know isn't necessarily an easy one to have either, we know that, so we all also don't want to make it seem like we have mastered this and that is why we're able to talk about these things more freely. Absolutely not. <laughs> we do, you know, we work on these things every single day, but the way that makes it easier is because we have each other. You know, we're able to lift each other up and, you know, we find out this is why I also love that not only with the show that we're giving this awareness, but I even get the chance to meet incredible people. I don't know that I would have had that chance otherwise. I don't, I don't even live in Texas, <laughs> obviously, so I don't know that I would have got the chance to cross paths with you in any other way, but I'm so grateful that I did, you know, and I just think you've also validated a lot for me today. So I'm hoping that viewers, if you feel the same way, that maybe that's your sign, right? That this is your time and the healing can start now because who cares if you didn't do it before? Nobody's, you know, nobody's keeping track. This is your life to live. Live it the way you want to and, you know, do whatever you can, you know what I mean? To make it the best life that, you know, is for you and not a life for other people. You know what I mean? You're living your own life. So do that, you know, however is right for you. So Denise, it was a wonderful pleasure having you on today. Thank you so much once again for letting us know. And if you want to just mention that website one more time before we wrap up, I would love that. Sure. It's thrivingaftersexualabusebook.com. And on there, you'll find my email address. If you want to send me an email, I'd love to hear from everyone and let me know how it goes and what you're doing on your healing journey. I'd be thrilled to hear if, if you were able to get the book and you found value in it, you had questions, I'd be happy to hear from anybody. Yay. And so with that, thank you, everyone. Appreciate you tuning in today. And definitely please reach out to Denise and anyone else that you hear. We'll make sure that we provide links um, in the, you know, in our comment section so that you can see that and be able to connect with her for sure. So thank you all. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.